Last week's scripture was from the third chapter of Acts and told the story of Peter and John healing the lame beggar outside the temple in Jerusalem. Today's scripture from chapter 4 continues that story. While Peter and John were speaking to the people, the priests, the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees came to them, much annoyed that they were teaching the people and proclaiming that in Jesus there is resurrection of the dead. So they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day. But there were many of those who heard the word and believed, and they numbered about 5,000. The next day, their rulers, elders, and scribes gathered in, in Jerusalem with Annas the high priest, Caiaphas, John, and Alexander, and others of a high priestly family. And when they had placed the prisoners in their midst, they asked, by what power or by what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders, if we are questioned today about a good deed done to someone who was sick and ask how it was that they were healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that this man is standing before you in good health by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified and whom God raised from the dead. This Jesus is the stone which was rejected by you, the builders, it has become the cornerstone. There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among mortals by which we must be saved. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and realized that they were uneducated and ordinary men, they were amazed and they recognized them as companions of Jesus. This is the word of God for all people today. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Larry. You're three for three, buddy. Would you pray with me and for me? Holy God, we come because we wanted to hear from you. So let the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts, let what we hear and see and experience in these moments be from you, you who are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Are you a bold person? When you send an email, is it all in capital letters? What do you think of when you think of boldness? Maybe it goes like this. To seek out new life and new civilizations. To boldly go where no one has gone before. Wouldn't it be great? I was just remembering that I built an enterprise when I was a kid. It was the original one, but uh, it doesn't matter. Um, wouldn't it be great if on those moments when we stepped out and said, I'm going to do, do the mission trip, or I'm going to show up at church and help with X, Y, or Z, and it makes me, I'm not sure I've never done anything like that before, but I'm going to try it. I'm going to go to Westerville Area Resource Ministry and help do whatever they ask me to do there, sort food or deliver food or talk to people. I don't know, I'm going to do what they ask me to do. And I'm not sure, or I'm going to go to Nicaragua for the first time or Cuba or Mexico or Redbird Mission or Church for All People down the street. And I'm not quite sure. Wouldn't it be great if at that moment when you took that bold step, bum, ba -ba -bum, ba -ba -ba, the music played, and you'd be like, okay, this is it. I'm doing it right because the music is playing. Like when you make that bold step and no music plays, step back. That's not, that wasn't it. When you make this bold step, duh, okay, that's it. Wouldn't that be great? 
it would be really helpful. Like I'm, I'm making the right step because the the orchestra played and it was it was epic at that moment. We think of boldness coming from within ourselves. Like I'm gonna get it. I'm gonna do it. We had kids exercise some boldness on our trip. Sasha, who is this tall? Um, no, she's taller than that, but she's not very tall, and she's afraid of ladders, and she ended up on a ladder. And I made her go one step higher, and she was mad. There's a picture. You didn't see it. There is a picture in our in our photo reel where she's, she's standing on a ladder. She's looking at me. I'm like, you got it. Get up there and do it. <coughs> and she did it. The next day, she just scampered up a ladder. But uh, we, we learn, and we take that boldness. And sometimes boldness comes from inside ourselves, just like space explorers, just like sometimes our military folks have to gather up some boldness and, and do the thing that they do, or folks who are fire and EMS gather some boldness and go into a burning building or do a thing. And there's, there's that kind of boldness that we think of when it's about, wow, some kind of unreasonable confidence when we can do that. Do you feel that every day? Y'all, don't leave me stand up here by myself. Do you feel that, that confidence every day? You get in your car and you're like, ah, I got this day. Some days, but maybe not every day. That's a kind of boldness. That's a kind of boldness. It's not the kind of boldness that Peter and John and the apostles have in this story, however. They have a thing that today we're calling holy boldness. And it's different. It doesn't come from within ourselves. We experience it within ourselves, but it doesn't come from us. Larry reminded us that Peter and John have been a part of, and as they came into the temple, they encountered a man. We we heard about this in rest as we talked about restoration last week, and they're on their way to the temple. And here's a dude who hasn't. It says that in in Acts in the original language. Here's a dude who has been lame since birth. He's not ever, 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 ever stood on his feet. And he's begging because that's the only way he can get sustenance. And he's there, and he's and Peter and John, as you remember, because you heard this last week. We don't have any silver or gold. We have no. We don't have any money. But what I have, I'll give to you. Get up and walk. That's unreasonable. Get up and walk. This man has never got up and walked. And if you remember in the story, sorry, my glasses are smeary and probably not distracting you, but it's bugging me. This man leaps up in that story. He doesn't just get up. They don't have to get his arm and do do like people do for me sometimes and get him up off the floor. He leaps up and goes into the temple. When's the last time you leapt up? (laughs) He leaps up and he does it. And then Peter says there's a little speech that happens in there, some preaching that happens. Peter and John are like, hey, this this Jesus is is the Messiah, and he was dead, and he rose again, and he's the real deal. And they're 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 sharing this story boldly. And we know that the the, the events of Pentecost happened not long before all of this. So being filled with the Holy Spirit is part of this. Right? So this all happens in the Sanhedrin. That's the name for this collection of religious authority people that Larry so helpfully listed for us that you'll read about. When you do your reading challenge to get your card stamped, you'll, chapter 4 will be in this first week, and you'll read all of this and be reminded because you're going to do that, right? Say yes. Just lie to me. Say yes. Okay. No, you're gonna, it's going to be great. <laughs> so as we, as we look at that, this all happening, these Sanhedrin are not happy because Peter and John are doing their job. Not Peter and John's job. Well, they are doing Peter and John's job, but the Sanhedrin feel like you're doing my job. The Sanhedrin are, well, see, I don't always like this story. The Sanhedrin are people like me. They've been to seminary. they got some fancy clothing to wear. You know, they're, doing, they're the very religious authority people. We're the ones who know, and we will explain it to you, and then you will know. Thank you very much. And I think they said it in exactly that tone of voice. And sometimes the folks who are academic folks who've done all the homework, I mean, quite frankly, we think we do know something, and hopefully it's helpful. And sometimes we get so excited about what we know, we think we've got it all tied up in a tidy little package, and it's finished. This is it. This is the truth. I'm going to give it to you. Don't mess with it. 
and Peter and John come on the scene with the other apostles because Jesus has come on the scene and sent them and the Holy Spirit has come and filled them and they're like hey we got um, sort of page two to the truth here so yeah that was our history the Sanhedrin aren't wrong but here's the rest of the story what are you going to do with that and the Sanhedrin don't like it enough so that they want to throw him in jail so they do because this cheese got messed with somebody is in their business and they don't like it because they had it finished have you ever built a sand castle yeah yeah do you ever look on on maybe on social media somewhere or wherever wherever you like to browse all those really valuable wonderful pictures we can find on the internet of stuff that doesn't matter and, and you know what I'm talking about when you, you're supposed to be at work, but you're, that, I never do that. I'm always working very hard when I'm here. But um, it's sermon research. That's what I call it. Yeah. Do you ever see one of those sandcastles somebody's made that's twice as tall as them? Like who goes to the beach with a ladder so they can make a sandcastle like that? And it's got 18 turrets and there's flags and there's, there's it's like, it, it's glorious. There's a moat. It's got real alligators in it. And it's just, it's all there. And somebody has worked really, it's like, whoa, you know. Wow. Did you ever make that sandcastle? Or did you make sandcastles like I did with my kids? Maybe you made this sandcastle where you've, you've got that plastic bucket that you've had since, I don't know, uh, the Eisenhower administration or something. And the handle's missing. You don't know whatever happened to the handle. It's only got one or two cracks in it. It still works pretty good for sandcastles. And you get some wet sand and you pack it in there. You got to pack it in there good, right? And then you, you got to do this quick. Flip it over. And it's got to be sort of wet sand or it'll suck all the water out of it. And it just goes, bloop. It makes that sound too, bloop. And, you, and you, you work the bucket loose. And you lift it off. And you have a bucket-shaped sandcastle. Do you ever make that sandcastle? It's fun, isn't it? Did you do it by yourself? Or did you? Or did someone help you? It's even more fun if someone's doing it with you, right? And then, oh, I found a stick, and it can be the flagpole. And I found these rocks, and they can be the little fence around it. And, and we'll dig a moat, and we'll, we'll, we'll float this log in there, and this little stick we found, this other stick, it's a little bigger, and it looks kind of like, see how it looks like it, it's a crocodile, and it's in the moat. And then here's this glass we found in a lake that's all polished because it's been going in the waves, and we'll put that around the top of the turret. And then, look, we found a clothespin. We'll draw a face on it. It's a little person, and it's the guard in the turret. And look at our castle! Isn't that great? Can you imagine that sandcastle? You sure you can't. It looks like a bucket, and it's got a clothespin on the top. But in our imagination, it becomes just as big, if not bigger, than that thing we saw that some imposter made on the Internet with a team of 38 people and five stepladders or whatever they, I don't know what they did. What happens to a sandcastle? If you build it at the ocean where the sand is wet and it's low tide, the tide comes in and it's gone. If you build it at Lake Michigan where there's, the water is salt-free and shark-free, as the shirt says, there's no tide. It might sit there on the beach for a while, but somebody's going to come along and rake the beach to smooth it out for the people tomorrow. Or the wind or the weather or the waves or some other kid who likes to kick over sandcastles comes along. <laughs> Is that you? <laughs> He's smiling. <laughs> He's like, yeah. <laughs> or, you know, sometimes we kick over our own sandcastle because we're done with it and we just smooth it out. And it's gone. And the sticks become sticks again and the little people become clothespins again and the fence becomes random stones that somebody steps on and says, ouch. And it's gone. What's the point? Our apostle friends were building sandcastles to heal a random person because they'd been given authority to do such a thing. They were telling their story because they'd been told, go, go make disciples, go do this, go tell your story, go do this thing. So they're trying to do that. They had no idea what they were doing. There's no... In the United Methodist Church, there's a book of discipline. That's why we're having a church conference this afternoon to do some things that the book of discipline says we need to do. So we're following, the, we have a rule book. We know what to do. 
we have our New Testament scriptures. We have letters from Paul. We have people telling the stories about Jesus in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We have the story of the early church in Acts. And those things give us some guidance about how to be church. Peter and John and the gang don't have that. They have the, their scripture, which is what we call the, the Old Testament. We might say the Hebrew scripture. It's got some ideas about but they don't know how to be a new church with this Jesus person in the mix. They're making it up as they go. We might say they were building the airplane while they're flying it. This afternoon, when you can't play in the yard because it's raining outside, get on YouTube and look up building the airplane while flying it. It's hilarious. They're making it up as they go. They're building a sandcastle. They don't know where they don't know Westerville's going to ever exist, let alone Church of the Messiah, let alone you sitting there in that seat. But what they do on that day leads to what we're doing on this day because of the story. What matters about the sandcastle isn't the finished product. The finished product is inconsequential in a normal family sandcastle. In a sandcastle contest when you're building that thing, yeah, that's one thing. But the ordinary sandcastle that we might make, the finished product, it was whatever. It's, that's why it's easy to kick it over. What's important about that sandcastle is the process of building it. The cooperation, the imagination, the excitement, the enthusiasm, the look what I, I found one of these. I can, I can contribute in my own way with this piece, and I have this piece, and I have that piece. And we put it all together, and it's something. And somebody else is going to look at it and say, huh. But they don't know how much fun it was to create it. Because the process mattered more than the finished product. On Wednesday, Russ is still here. Sus Susan, our, our anniversary was Wednesday, the 21st. My anniversary always feels like the longest day of the year. And we celebrated by going on a double date with Hope and Russ Seal to Kindway Ministries uh, reunion dinner over at Bethel United Methodist Church. So uh, we went and did that together. We had a, gr a great time. I didn't know, but I was sitting with celebrities because Hope was one of the founding board members for Kindway Ministries. Kindway is something that, that really grew out of the Kairos movement. Ky Kairos is a three-day weekend uh, spiritual retreat experience, like Emmaus or Chrysalis or, or any of those that you've heard of, um, except that it happens in prison with, with men or women, depending on which prison, um, and they get this experience and a chance to hear about Jesus and maybe have a personal encounter that can be life-changing. It's great. And what was happening with Kairos is Boom, Kairos. And there are little Kairos reunion things that happen, but it was really sort of drive-by evangelism. Right? It's not so different from the person that knocks on your door, says, hey, do you have a few minutes to talk about Jesus? And they tell you about Jesus, and then they walk away. And there you are. Okay, now I heard about it. What do I do with that? How do I build a sandcastle with, I got sticks and sand and a bucket, but I don't know how they go together. <laughs> right? Folks with Kairos realized some, what, about 11 years ago, sitting in a room, I don't know, eight or nine of them, hey, we're not doing the whole job. And they started imagining, what if we got to know these folks before they were released? Some of these folks have been in prison 30, 35 years. Can you imagine how much life changes in 30? Think about that. 35 years ago, what kind of smartphone did you have? Did you have a cell phone at all? I didn't. And then we had those brick, those bag phones and brick phones and so on and so forth, and we got to smartphones, but we've lived through that whole sort of evolution of communication technology. We know something about what to do with a smartphone. But if you went from zero, from, a, from the old, remember when you had in the kitchen that phone that hung on the wall, from that to a smart, what do I do? I don't know what to do. So what if we had people we called navigators and they met people while they were still inside and then we had maybe some programs for folks who are struggling with addiction or who have mental health things or who have other things to work through, personal trauma and all that kind of, whatever it is, let's figure out how to begin to address that before they leave. And then upon release, not say, well, good luck. I hope you learned your lesson. We call that retributive justice. You did something wrong, whack. That's punishment for you're supposed to learn your lesson. Well, that's good as far as it goes. 
but if I don't help you with the learning process, does anything really change? The recidivism rate in Ohio's prisons runs anywhere from 35 to 50 percent. Recidivism being people going back after they get out. Kindway gets involved for the folks before they leave, gets to know them, develops a relationship, some trust. These are not folks who trust easily. In prison, you don't trust anybody because that's how you survive. And then upon release, the navigator stays involved with that person. And let's help you find a place to stay and let's help you find a job and let's help you with, oh, you've got an apartment, but you don't even know what to do with an apartment. So we'll show up at your house. A lady who had been in prison 35 years shared this story on Wednesday. My navigator came to the house and said, well, honey, what, what are you doing? No furniture, no nothing. Just got an apartment. I don't know what to do. Now, because there's relationship, the ability to say out loud, I don't know what to do. We don't like to admit that. It takes a kind of boldness to say, I need help. She was able to say that to her navigator. Her navigator said, oh, well, I brought a piece of paper and a pencil. Because the navigator already knew it was going to be a problem. They've done it before. 184 times folks have come through the Kindway program in 11 years. 184 people have come through there. So they made a list. You need furniture. You need a refrigerator. You need food. You need curtains. You need a shower curtain. You need all these things. And then folks in the Kindway program, some were donations, some were, we'll go to the store. It all happens like bread and fish. And this person has what they need in their apartment, and they can figure out how to start living there and go to work and do the things, and let's help you connect with recovery. They just walk with somebody through all the ups and downs of figuring it out. It's not a linear process. The recidivism rate in the state of Ohio, you heard me say it, was what? Quiz time. 33 to 50. Recidivism rate for Kindway, people who finish the program, 1.5%. Because somebody was bold enough to show up. That's holy boldness. It's not a big dramatic statement. It's not a big dramatic speech. It's not being so forceful that you make someone agree with you or take your side of any one of the many things that we take sides about. It's about showing up and saying, how are, how are you today? And meeting it. And being willing to hear the answer. And then being willing to say, let's see what we can figure out. And as a group, doing it. As church, <coughs> excuse me, we are in, intended, God intended us to be the embodied presence of Christ in 2023 in Westerville. That's who we're supposed to be. When God says, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit to be in you and work through you, that's saying, Jesus was here, died, rose again, ascended, now it's you. And we are the embodied presence of Christ. We're supposed to show up. That's what holy boldness looks like. And when we show up, we find out that among all the really get weird gathered bits and pieces that we find, on our figurative beach, we have everything we need to build a sandcastle that's glorious when we do it together. We're making it up as we go. Every sandcastle we build, probably going to get kicked over. We're going to build it again. We're going to build it again. We're going to build it again. It can feel sort of tiresome. The call is to continue showing up, to put wet sand in our bucket, to build it again, and to keep trying. That's holy boldness. I invite you to rise as you're able to join me in this affirmation of faith. This is the good news which we have received, in which we stand, and by which we are saved. Christ died for our sins, was buried, was raised on the third day, and appeared first to the women, then to Peter and the twelve, and then to many faithful witnesses. We believe Jesus is the Christ, the anointed one of God, the firstborn of all creation, the firstborn from the dead, in whom all things hold together, in whom the fullness of God was pleased to dwell by the power of the Spirit. Christ is the head of the body, the church, 
and by the blood of the cross reconciles all 